Welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. This series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of the Exascale Computing Project of the US Department of Energy. And this series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley, and uh, Ashley Barker from Oak Ridge and I will be the hosts for today's webinar what I learned from 20 years of leading open source projects. And the, the webinar will be presented by Wolfgang Bungard. Wolfgang is a professor of mathematics and geosciences at Colorado State University. He studied physics and mathematics at the University of Stuttgart and Heidelberg in Germany. He was a postdoc at the Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences, uh, now the Odin Institute and uh, Institute of Geophysics at the University of Texas in Austin. He joined uh, the Department of Mathematics, Mathematics of Texas A&M uh, in 2005 and moved to Colorado State in 2016. During his PhD, Wolfgang started the DIL2 finite element library that now contains more than a million lines of C++ code. He's also one of the main developers of the aspect code, which is widely used in the simulation of convection in the earth mantle and for also for long-term deformation in the crust. We have issued 212 tickets for this webinar and all attendees have been muted upon the entry. We'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc. I'll paste the, this address in, in the chat momentarily. And the webinar will have breaks so Wolfgang can respond to the questions that come in. Uh, with that, Wolfgang, I'll stop my sharing here. Okay, well, thank you, Asni. Thank you, um, everybody at uh, the Better Scientific Software um, Organization. That's an organization that I really um, think um, we need it in our community, and I'm really glad that uh, you guys exist and put on uh, webinars like this. So um, what I uh, want to talk about today is um, I am, like many others, uh, sort of an, uh, an, an accidental person to fall into open source projects. That was not part of my um, career plan. Uh, I uh, was a graduate student in mathematics and I just wanted to become a faculty and a professor and I um, well, needed to write some software and um, it um, turned into a career. And, um, I, um, I've been doing this for um, over 20 years now. Um, 24 um, that I started this uh, one project that I'm going to talk about. And um, along the way, I've, I've learned a lot of things about what works and what doesn't work, and I want to share some of those. Um, I do want to acknowledge that um, a lot of um, organizations have funded the work that um, I have done with many others, uh, particularly the National Science Foundation and uh, the Computational Infrastructure for Geodynamics. Um, I also want to say um, that um, this work that I'm going to talk about is not just mine. There are many, many others around the world that have contributed to these software projects, um, hundreds of people. And uh, many of those with whom I've worked closely over the last 20 years have um, really informed what I'm thinking about um, when we talk about open source projects. So um, I have had the great fortune that I've worked with lots of people who are um, smart and insightful and have um, put a lot of thought into communities and um, how to deal with people. And um, so what I'm going to talk about when I say that I learned it um, is as much a reflection as uh, what I've learned from my co colleagues and collaborators. So I, um, I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. So let me, um, let me talk to you um, first um, where I'm coming from, what, what my experience with uh, scientific software is. Um, so I started, in, um, I started my PhD in 1998 uh, and sort of at the end of my master's project before that, um, I started a project that's now called DEAL2 um, that today is a million and a half lines of C++. Um, it's uh, one of the three or four or five um, large uh, finite element packages that exist out there. Um, things that um, have meshes and finite elements and linear solvers and everything you need to uh, build finite element solvers for partial differential equations. And there are currently 
um, 11 principal developers. Um, so these are the people who um, oversee the growth of this, uh, of this project, who approve patches and so on and so forth. And um, over um, these 24 years, um, about 300 people have contributed to this project. So it's a quite a sizable project. Um, it is used by a lot of people, and we know of about 200 or 220 or 240 papers per year that uh, use DL2, and that's probably an underestimate. Um, so that's one of the projects. The other project is uh, called Aspect, that is the advanced solver for um, problems in Earth convection. Um, so it's a, um, a software package that builds on top of DL2 and simulates um, how material moves in the Earth's interior. Um, we started this in 2011, about 10 years ago. Um, it is now about 150,000 lines of C++. It uh, simulates convection in the Earth mantle. Um, it's also used in simulating the deformation of the lithosphere um, today. Um, there are nine principal developers um, and about 100 contributors um, to this project over these 10 years. So the project that I'm going to tell you most about in the next few minutes is, um, is DL2, um, simply because it's the bigger one and because it's been around for longer. Um, and I think it illustrates a little bit of um, like the, the arc many of these um, big scientific software projects um, follow. Um, so um, before I tell you the, the details of this project, um, let me just summarize really what um, I learned um, from running these projects. Um, and it is principally that um, what you really should care about is uh, building sustainable software, um, things that can last for 24 years, um, and that in order to do this, you need to build communities. Um, and um, if I had to summarize this on into two sentences, really about not it's not just about being a good programmer, that a lot of us got into this business because we were, we enjoy programming. But what it really is, once you pass a certain threshold, is that you have to deal with, with people. And in particular, you have to understand the limitations of people. And um, the, um, the limitations come in two forms. One is that um, a million and a half lines it's a huge system. It's much more than you can ever think about understanding or reading through. Um, it's it's a complicated combination of things that, that have to work together and you have to make it work. You have to somehow wrap your brain around what that means for a system. Um, and the other part is that um, you deal with people. Um, so the first one is sort of the, the human limitation about understanding complex systems. And the other one is the limitations of people working in organizations. Okay, so let me let me start um, by talking about um, the technical complexity um, of these projects, and, and let me finally come back to the question of the, the arc of these projects. So, um, the O2, like many other um, large, successful open source projects in, in the sciences. Um, it started as a fairly small, a simple project for one person. Um, and if you look at this, there's really a fundamental difference um, between where DL2 or any of these projects started and where they are now. Um, so in the case of DL2, um, I started this in late 1997 um, as a single graduate student, um, just for myself. And I wrote about 20,000 lines of uh, code in year one. Um, then acquired about uh, acquired two co-authors, um, one of whom was a fellow grad student who was sitting in the same room as me, and one at the time was a, um, a postdoc in the room next door. Um, and so the world was fairly small at the time, right? Um, so after two years, uh, we had three people. Uh, we had about 100,000 lines of code. And DL2 did not, ex did not depend on any external dependency. So we did not use any other software projects be beyond just um, uh, a compiler and make. Um, and uh, we also had no external users. Um, so if um, somebody wanted to implement something, the worst that could happen is that you have to walk um, to the room next door and figure out, well, how do I do this? Or how does this interfere with what you're doing right now? So a very small world um, 
very self-contained, um, quite easy to manage. And then in uh, 2000, um, we put it on a website because that's what you could at the time. Um, so 2000 was roughly the time when people started to take the, um, the internet, the World Wide Web, as something that you could play with, um, that um, as an individual, you can put a website on there. And um, we really had no, no intention for this to be anything other than putting on a website because we can. Um, we didn't think about, well, what does that mean if other people start to use it, for example, or do we have to support this? Do we have to document this? Um, so um, our world at the time was solidly with three people in two rooms next, next to each other. And I think that this sort of um, mindset that we had at the time is actually quite typical of um, how many scientific codes um, start, right? Somebody has, a, has an itch and they scratch it by writing a little bit of, uh, of software for themselves that does what they needed to do and get a couple of papers out of it or solve a problem um, that they needed to solve for their work. Um, so that's sort of where we were in 2000. Um, today, um, this project has uh, a million and a half lines of code and it grows by 100,000 lines per year. Um, so it's a vastly bigger thing. Um, and I think if you um, want to put this into context, so a, um, a good programmer writes between 10 and 20,000 lines of code per year. Um, so let's pretend 20,000 lines per year. And one and a half million lines is about 80 years of full-time work. Um, that is much, much more than any single person can keep in their, in their head. Um, there is not one person in this project anymore now who really understands all of the code. There are 11 principal developers. Um, these are the people who um, approve patches, for example, and many of us have sort of specialized into different areas. So I don't know anything about the continuous integration uh, setup, for example. I don't know anything about the matrix free framework in VL2. Um, and the other 10 principal developers um, also have their own specialities where they know certain parts and not others. Um, I mentioned this before, there's about 300 people who've uh, contributed to this uh, project over the years. And um, we counted this a while ago. Um, every quarter, um, every three months, um, it is approximately 40 different people who contribute um, code. So it's a sizable organization of, of people who participate in this as developers. And then there's an even bigger class of people um, who use this project. So we have about 1,200 people on the mailing list. I don't know how many of those are actually using it every day, for example, but it's a sizable um, number. Um, it is used in many, many individual research projects, in individual um, PhD projects um, where somebody's writing a code for their own needs. Um, but then there are also substantial packages like Aspect, uh, for example, that have their own user communities that build on DL2. Um, so it is, I think as far as scientific software is concerned, DL2 is quite widely used. Um, the direction where I'm going with this is um, that in addition to being a big and complicated organization con consisting of many different people with different motivations, it is technically also a much, much more difficult package to deal with today. And so deal two um, doesn't just have a million and a half lines of code, but it uses many other packages itself. Um, and I'm illustrating this here um, in, in, a, in a graph that shows the dependencies between packages in a collection that is called the XSDK, the Exascale Software Development Kit. It's a collection that um, the um, Exascale Computing Project um, is maintaining that consists of a whole bunch of software libraries um, that all somehow depend on each other. And um, XSDK is a way to make sure that they, can, that they interoperate today and continue to interoperate and it provides a, a way also to build all of these. And um, deal two is the one in the red circle um, somewhere at the top. And what you can see is that each one of these gray lines um, indicates a dependency. That means that it points from DL2, for example, to another package that DL2 can use. Um, so the text, of course, is much too small. That's part of the beauty of this graph, because it doesn't really matter what all of these other packages are. Um, 
But to give you an idea, there's, for example, Petsy and Trillinos um, that provide linear algebra capabilities to DL2. Um, there are eigenvalue solvers. Um, there are direct um, linear solvers and so on and so forth. Um, so DL2 today builds on, I think, around 40 external packages, quite a lot. And um, of course, that is on top of just the, the many, many lines of C++ DL2 has itself, right? So um, that has implications um, for the technical complexity behind this project. Um, so in particular, DL2, like many other scientific software packages, is no longer a collection of subroutines like we used to have in the 1980s and 90s in the form of BLAS and LAPAC. And so BLAS is the basic linear algebra subroutine. And it was literally just a collection of, you know, I know it's somewhere between 50 and 200 individual functions that sometimes called each other, but um, otherwise were independent of the rest of the software universe. Um, this is not how scientific software looks anymore today. Um, instead, packages form an interconnected web where um, packages built on each other, and then on the very top is the application that, um, that does something useful based on these packages. And if you wanted to break this down a little bit more, um, then you would actually see that um, many of the packages in this graph that I just showed you themselves have modules. Um, so DL2 itself has modules that deal with linear algebra, that deal with meshes, that deal with finite elements, that deal with matrix-free um, operators, and so on and so forth. Um, and similarly, if you looked at packages like Trillinos and Petsy, they also consist of modules. And, um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that, um, like I already mentioned about myself, nobody can actually understand each, just one of these packages individually. Why are things this way? It's because no single developer can know this much, right? So if it takes 80 man years to write something like DL2, um, it must be clear that not a single person can, can ever read through all of this. Um, cannot know, cannot remember every detail of this. Things have to be broken down into smaller pieces. And that is certainly true. If it's true for DO2, it's true for the entire ecosystem that DO2 builds on as well, right? I might be very good at uh, finite element methods, but I certainly don't have the background to really know how to write a direct solver or um, you know, an algebraic multigrid, for example. So in order to deal with my inability to learn all of these things and to implement these is I need to build on what other people have done. And um, so things break into smaller components uh, that are built by experts in their own field. Um, so we have to do it this way because we want to use things that are just so complicated um, that we cannot do it all ourselves. Um, and that is true also for something like BLAS, for example. So in the 1980s, um, BLAS was relatively simple. You would just, um, each one of these subroutines fundamentally was just uh, one or several loops that, that iterate over the indices of matrices and vectors. Um, but today, you have to know um, cache behavior and maybe multi core behavior and um, vectorization instructions and so on and so forth. And um, yeah, I could, I could write today um, a 1980s version of the BLAS and uh, incorporate that into the L2. But that is not appropriate anymore because we know how to do better or somebody knows how to do better. And um, the best strategy, of course, is to let that person write um, an optimized plot and I use it. We have to do it this way because we cannot learn this much and we cannot know this much anymore. There are, on the other hand, costs associated with this. And um, so for our users, uh, the, the first step um, always is to have to, to get through the installation. In order to um, build the program on DL2, you have to install not just DL2, but possibly also Pepsi and Trillinos and RPAC and um, UMF pack and a whole bunch of other things. And it's complicated to do it this way. Um, it is made even more complicated by the fact that each one of these packages that you have to um, install and maybe interact with have their own styles of coding and um, documenting things. Um, they might all have their own way of teaching. Um, so some of those might have tutorials. Others have YouTube videos. Um, others have only in-source comments and so on and so forth. And so in order to deal with all of these many different packages, you have to learn that they're all different. 
you know, it's not just that they implement different things, but their style is different. And then for people like me, for example, if you're a package developer, you realize that uh, well, if you build an other, on other software, um, that other software is not static. Um, it changes. Um, people introduce incompatible changes. Um, and so what happens to us quite frequently is that we put out a release and a month later, uh, one of the packages we built on puts out another release that is incompatible and suddenly you can't install DL2 anymore with um, the then current version of whatever you wanted to install or built on. And so um, that's aggravating, but this is just the world that we live in. And then um, as a, um, if, if you deal with these big packages um, and you think about this maybe a little bit more from, well, it takes all of this knowledge to interact with other um, packages and, and to break it down into modules, for example, you start to think also about, well, how exactly is this technical knowledge preserved in the project? Um, so who knows what and how many people know what? Um, and in the software world, this is um, often um, described as the best factor. It's sort of a macabre concept. It is the number of people um, who um, can get run over by a bus without the project falling apart. And I um, struggled with whether I really wanted to um, call it this way in this talk, um, but this is how everybody calls it. And so I decided maybe I'll go to Wikipedia um, to find out whether there's a better word. It turns out there's not, but Wikipedia actually has quite interesting um, things to say about the bus factor. So they define it as the minimum number of team members that have to suddenly disappear from a project before the project stalls due to lack of knowledgeable or competent personnel. And I think that's, an, that's a really nice description of, of what it really is about. That um, if, for example, we have 11 principal maintainers, but we all have our individual um, specialities, then um, maybe we can afford um, if one of these people moves on in their career, for example, or maybe at one point retires, um, but that person is going to take knowledge with them. Um, and maybe not every sub-module of DL2 is well covered by multiple people. So the technical knowledge um, that um, is required to deal with complex systems is really quite an issue. Um, in particular, um, so Wikipedia also on that page um, says that um, somebody um, determined what the bus factor is for a number of um, popular GitHub projects. And that for most of these, the bus factor would be one or two. Um, and that means that if, two, if these two people um, happen to um, decide that they've had it, they're retired, or maybe they, if they work in academia, maybe they become department head or, or do any, any other thing other than being software developers, these projects are dead. Um, so that is, um, that is a consequence of dealing with these complicated systems. Right, that um, a system that consists of a few hundred or a few thousand lines of code is not that hard to learn for somebody else to take over. Um, if you had a system that has uh, a million lines of code, it is very, very difficult for somebody else to take over if the first person is not there anymore. So um, how do we deal with this, um, with this issue of complexity? Um, I think the answer fundamentally is quite poorly. Um, I think a lot of folks in our community are aware of it, but we don't really have very good strategies. Um, we talk about software design in ways that we think makes it easier to modularize software, for example, make it easier to learn for other people, at least parts of it. Um, but software design, I think for for most of us, it's as much an art and a craft as it is science. Um, we don't really understand it. We know what good software design is when we see it, but it's quite difficult to teach it. Um, and I think um, I, I'm going to show you two quotes that are fundamentally about software design that sort of illustrate the fact that software design is not some technical discipline, but it, it is about um, understanding that we write software for people and not for computers, right? Um, so um, it deals with human limitations, human time, for example. So um, Donald Knuth had this um, um, 
by now a rather famous comment of that we should forget about small efficiencies about 97% of the time. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. The context of that quote was um, to say that um, we're not writing software um, to make it optimal because that makes it much harder to read, right? It also wastes effort. And um, maybe a, a more cogent way of saying that um, is by Martin Founder who says, any fool can write code that is that a computer can understand, good programmers write code that humans can understand. And that, I mean, these two quotes really um, embody how I think about software, that um, when I review other people's um, contributions to DL2 or to Aspect, for example, the key piece is to write code that in a year or two, somebody else can understand. Um, and whether or not it's fast or maybe optimally fast, that is not really my first consideration. Um, I mean, it is something that if it later turns out that the code is too slow, we can address this. But the first consideration is that we should write code that we can understand in a year or two, because if we can't, then this is this part of the software can no longer be changed, right? It implements a certain functionality that presumably other people will want to use. But we cannot change that anymore if we don't understand what it does and how it works. And so the key piece really in software design is um, to write code that is understandable to humans, that is changeable later on, that is modularized. And uh, what is not understandable, for example, is if you had code that consists of just one giant package that does not consist of submodules, for example. Um, that, of course, also goes to questions like go to, for example, or the size of, um, of functions, right? We need to break things into understandable pieces. So that sounds like it's just a giant mess. It's all, it's all gloom and doom. And, uh, we cannot possibly deal with software of this size. And I, I think that's really not the, um, not the message that I want to convey. I think there are um, really good approaches that we've learned over the years. Um, so for example, there are many good technical solutions um, that work around human limitations. So for example, we forget and we forget function names. And um, I mean, that is certainly true for libraries like Blast that they had to encode everything into six character uh, function names, but that's true also for DL2 that has literally tens of thousands of functions in the public interface that you could call. And um, one of the ways we as humans have learned to deal with this, that we um, have uh, integrated development environments that have autocomplete, right? You start to write the name of a function uh, because maybe that's the part that you remember and then you just hit control space and it autocompletes the name. And as a consequence, for example, um, in our practice in DL2, um, we're quite happy to use fairly long function names that are descriptive. Um, because you don't have to write it on anymore. You just autocomplete it. Um, another human limitation is we make mistakes all the time, right? Uh, we, um, we have bugs in our code and um, we um, break code later on. Um, and we deal with this by writing test suites. Um, so DL2 has a test suite that um, has about 12,000 or maybe 13,000 tests by now. And so fundamentally, every comma that you ever want to change uh, needs to run through this entire test suite so we can make sure that um, whatever we change um, does not actually break something. Um, we also have learned how to do peer review, right? That not every, or every patch in DL2, whether it is from a newcomer or from me, has to go through peer review where somebody looks at it and thinks about, well, is this code correct, for example? Um, Dealing with software installation, for example, is repetitive and boring. So we use package managers um, and uh, we have learned that we can't keep things in sync. Um, so if there are two different places that somehow depend on each other, it, we have a habit of just changing one and not the other. And the most uh, common place where that happens is this documentation that we cannot keep a separate manual in sync with the code. And as a consequence, we have developed tools that can extract documentation from the code itself in such a way that we really have to change only one place. Um, and so just to give you the names of some of these tools, if you ever wanted to look them up. So for autocomplete, for example, I use Eclipse and other people use Visual Studio. 
yet others use queues to create there are many many IDEs that um, that read and understand code and can use autocomplete can look up where a function is defined can show you the documentation of a function as you call it and so on and so forth uh, for testing there's C test there's Google test there are many many other um, testing frameworks for code review we use github for continuous integration there are github actions and Jenkins uh, for package managers, you can use CMake, SPAC, and many Linux repositories that make um, installation a lot easier. For documentation, we use Doxygen. Um, and there are other solutions for other programming languages. But so these are all technical solutions um, that fundamentally address human limitations. There are um, other categories of things that, uh, for which there is maybe not a technical solution that does the work for you, but um, there are collections of best practices. Um, so for example, there are um, good descriptions of how you should write documentation. Um, there are um, good descriptions of how to write teaching materials. Um, there are good descriptions of how to onboard new people. I'm gonna come back to that uh, later in this talk. And then um, there are um, coding styles, software patterns, naming conventions, and so on and so forth. And it is um, something that I do with um, every generation of my graduate students that will read through books, for example, that cover these sort of topics. Because they really, I think, make the difference between somebody who's a good programmer for an individual project, as opposed to somebody who knows how to contribute to a much bigger project. Um, that, uh, you need to have sort of a vocabulary, for example, about software patterns um, that makes it easier for you to document things in a way that um, is understandable to others because you're using the same words. Um, or you have to have um, an understanding of the of why naming conventions are useful um, because it makes it easier for other people later to read your code. Um, and so um, among the, the things that I um, have read, um, with my students is Code Complete, for example, Steve McConnell, the thick book, more than a thousand pages, maybe didn't have to be quite that thick, but um, there are other um, books in the same direction that discuss these sort of best practices. Um, for um, design patterns, there's the book by the Gang of Four, um, first name, the first author is Gamma. Um, there are many others that have appeared in the last 20 years on this too. Um, there is a book by Carl Fogel about producing open source software that um, talks a lot about sort of organizations. Um, and then um, a lot of us um, also, when we interact with other projects, when we build on other projects, we take some time to read through their documentation and tutorials with an eye towards, well, how do they do it, right? What, what can we extract from how they do it for how we could do better for ourselves? And then um, I should, uh, be remiss if I um, don't also mention uh, the Better Scientific, Scientific Software Organization, the organization that puts on this webinar, that has a lot of um, resources in this regard as well. Um, so th there are a lot of really good um, technical tools and best practices um, that address the issue of dealing with technical complexity in, in software projects. So just to sum this up, um, so th this part, um, I, I think that um, building workable scientific software projects um, is really about managing um, the complexity and um, managing the complexity in, in the sense that humans have limitations around complex systems. And that is really no different from, let's say, how pilots interact with airplanes and how city managers um, think about um, the electric and sewage system in cities and how, um, let's say, an architect would approach building an airport. These are all complex systems that go far beyond um, how an individual can um, understand it. And um, so you have to break it down into smaller units that are understandable, extendable, workable. Um, so a large, a large amount of time really goes into breaking things into manageable chunks, writing documentation specifically about the interfaces of different, um, different modules, writing teaching material, and building infrastructure that allows you to build these projects. Um, there's, my perspective is not so much that um, the issue is with the technical tools. There are really very good technical tools and um, best practices, but it's really about the human ability to 
understand and deal with complex systems and, and how we how we make it work somehow. So this was what I had to say about the technical complexity, and I want to move to the human complexity, but it would also be a good place um, to see if there are any questions. Hi. Yes, we, we do have some questions here in huh? the Google Docs. So let me go here. So first question, what happened to deal one? <laughs> Yeah, deal one um, was built um, by another set of three grad students, and um, they and their research groups continue to use it, but um, it, it, it has not become an open source software project like deal two has. Okay, uh, another question here. How do you balance time between contributing to open source projects and the work responsibilities? I will come back to that in the second part here. Okay, so then let's go for the next question then. Did you learn software development by use or did you take any professional software development classes? No, I'm, I'm self-taught in this regard. So I, I studied physics and then was a grad student in mathematics and then eventually became a faculty in mathematics. And um, so I don't have a software design background, but I spend a lot of time educating myself. Um, so um, I, I, I I can't say that I'm uneducated about the topic, um, but I but I have no formal education. I don't have a degree. Uh, Wolfgang, how are you addressing the transition to GPUs? Yeah, I don't. But um, I I personally don't. I don't know anything about it. Um, but other people in the project do, and they are addressing it. Yeah. Okay, so there are two more questions here. So um, before we continue, did you stumble? on any anti patterns that you would want to share? Um, that's probably a, um, a too technical um, part to discuss here, but um, I mean, yeah, we make mistakes. <laughs> um, yes, so then you can, you, you can address in the, in the question and answers yeah, after later. Fine, yeah. Uh, let's take another question here. How did you manage to find 11 developers? I'm also going to come back to that in, um, in the next part. Um, okay, so for the, sake of, for the sake of time, people are typing, but for the sake of time, please continue. Okay. Okay, so um, the other part that I want to talk about is um, that these projects consist of a lot of people. And, and how do you actually deal with this? And um, so, let me just outline sort of the problem that, that um, we have here. A lot of research projects, um, or a lot of scientific software research projects. So there is no, um, there is no documented solution that you just have to implement. Um, and as a consequence, the people who, um, who work on these sort of projects are oftentimes not um, software engineers or computer scientists, but are um, mathematical, physical chemists, chemical scientists themselves. So um, the things that they implement, they, they are both the developers of new research um, methods um, and, um, and software engineers at the same time. Um, so that, that makes one part already quite difficult. Um, the other part is um, most of the participants in scientific software projects are temporary employees. Um, I should have put quotes around employees um, because sometimes they work at national labs, for example. But in any case, they, they're often graduate students and postdocs. Um, so the time that they spend on working on a certain project is quite limited. Um, there are also often unpaid volunteers, people from around the world um, connected through the internet uh, who are graduate students at other universities, for example, who I have absolutely no control over. Um, so they're unpaid from my perspective. They, I mean, they might be paid for the work, but they, I don't pay them and they volunteer to the project. Um, and finally, they're generally people without a formal um, computer science education. And, and so there's a lot of challenges that come with this. Um, so let me go through this. The fact that most of these people are working on our project on a, on a strictly time limited basis means that um, for the people who are senior leaders um, of projects who are there on a, on a more permanent basis, they spend a lot of time onboarding new contributors, teaching them how to write better software, how to participate in a bigger project, how to use GitHub, for example. 
systems. And there's a lot of teaching and mentoring that is necessary um, because we have people who come and go all the time, right? Um, it also means that there's a, a higher importance on code review, for example, that um, if um, you deal with people who don't have a formal CS education and are new to a project, they don't know our style yet, for example. And so you have to um, spend a significant amount of time um, on reviewing code. Also, if you're a graduate student and um, your job is to write a PhD thesis um, and then maybe get a job in industry, you don't quite feel the same uh, level of ownership in a, in a piece of code than maybe I do, right? This is, this is my baby. I started this 20 some years ago um, and I run it with some of my best friends now. And, um, and so I have ownership and pride in this project, but um, somebody who only needs to get a, a, a job done may not quite have that ownership and pride. Um, so leadership in these sort of situations needs to make up for a lot of experience and quality. Um, and oftentimes that means maybe we accept this code now and then you as a principal developer go back and fix it up or document it better. Um, these, these sort of things. Um, the fact that we deal with volunteers that are not paid by our project means that in practice, it is often quite difficult for us um, to establish roadmaps. Um, so when we write our proposals, for example, to the National Science Foundation, it's not so easy for us to say what will actually be done in the next five years because a lot, most of the development is by somebody who has an itch and scratches it for writing a piece of functionality and contributed. I can't, I can't tell anybody what to do. Um, right? They're not my employees, and I have to treat them from a very different perspective. I have to accept that they do what they want to do. Um, that, again, puts a lot of responsibility on senior leaders, right? Um, same issues, right? Constant onboarding, a lot of teaching, mentoring, a lot of code review. Um, and um, it also means that the senior leadership um, deals with a lot of the key infrastructure improvement, things that are too big um, or too technical for um, somebody who comes in um, as a grad student somewhere to provide. Because I don't know, think about you know making it run on 10,000 processors and, and building a data structure. That is something that needs somebody who has a longer term um, horizon um, on this project. The other part is um, volunteers um, come and go. Um, and so um, a lot of uh, the work that we do is trying to really grow the pool of volunteers, making sure that for everybody who leaves, there is one or more who are willing to, um, to join, right? And um, so we spend a lot of time mentoring people and trying to make sure that they get credit for what they um, should get credit for, because that is a way to grow the pool of volunteers. And then there's the issue of um, having to deal um, with the principal developers themselves. So um, if I think about myself and my 10 colleagues, for example, so we fill many different roles, right? We're not just um, managers in the human resources um, um, sense, but we um, manage the technical infrastructure. We maintain the institutional knowledge of um, how does this whole project work together. Uh, we spend a lot of time onboarding and mentoring contributors for review patches. And then we also do technical work um, that is that requires, you know, 10 years of experience or 20 years of experience with a piece of software. Um, and all of this is made more difficult because in academia um, or in the national labs, um, the so the people who typically run scientific software projects, these people typically also have to manage their own careers, right? Um, so as a faculty, I have to teach, I have to supervise graduate students, I have to publish. Um, similar um, constraints are on people who are permanent technical staff at the national labs or in the industry, for example. So we have to uh, fund, find funding for our work. We have to document our work. Um, all of these sort of things put a lot of demand on principal developers' time. and. Um, that I find difficult to manage for myself. It is also very difficult for me, for example, to ask my fellow principal developers for their own time because I know that they also struggle with this. Um, at the same time, if you're um, a person like me and you like to interact with other people, um, 
at the same time also like doing technical work, this is not such a bad job, right? I've, I've made a good career out of something that I really enjoy doing. Um, so the diversity of this job is something that I really enjoy. So I was asked um, whether I can distill some of this into a few recommendations. Um, and so um, let me um, go through just some of those. So for the technical aspects, the part that I talked about in the first part of this talk is there are some really good technical tools out there. So um, IDEs like Eclipse or Visual Studio, for example, and you should really be using them instead of Emacs or VI that are fundamentally just glorified editors. Um, tools like Eclipse understand a million lines of code and understand what the member functions of a class are in ways that Emacs and VI never can and never were built to either. Um, um, you should use things like CMake instead of write your own makes make files. You should use tools like Doxygen instead of writing your own documentation tools. Um, you should use GitHub for um, peer review of, of code. And you should be teaching all of these tools too, right? So, I mean, maybe I, I, I have used Emacs since 1991. I really know every keystroke in Emacs. Um, but I can't, um, or I try not to use it uh, when I interact with students because they will never, um, have that technical expertise to work with Emacs the way I do. And as a consequence, I really try very hard to teach myself tools like Eclipse because then I can teach them to the students, right, or to, to collaborators. And the same is true um, that I might be a good um, programmer, um, but it certainly helps me to read up on best practices um, because then I can teach these to other people as well um, who may need the expertise codified in books because they do not have 30 years of programming experience yet. And for the human aspect, um, so, um, I mean, one of the things that I always tell people who are interested in joining open source projects is to really think about is this, is this compatible with your career aspirations? I mean, um, some of us spend inordinate amounts of time running these sort of projects. That is something that we can only do because we have found that it is compatible with what we do in our careers because it's appreciated by our, our departments or our universities or our employers. Um, and only then can you actually make that step and say, yes, this is a project that I want to lead and uh, on which I'm willing to spend 20 hours a week. Um, if you do this step, um, understand that where people are coming from, that you're not leading a software project in an industrial sense, right? You're not a manager. Uh, most of the people you interact with are there because that's what they enjoy doing, but they're not paid by you. Um, and so um, it really takes understanding that people come from different directions to this project and, um, and, and taking them where they are. Um, you will spend a lot of time mentoring um, and you will have to, if you want this project to survive long term, try to be welcoming to newcomers um, and be generous with praise. And um, so that's the question coming back to how did I find 10 other principal developers? These are all people who started to use the project and who saw the value and saw value in contributing because their contributions were appreciated. And um, so as a project, we talk about this all the time that we really try to be welcoming and generous um, to people uh, beyond what maybe is necessary, because that is what um, allows us to build a community around it. So just to conclude this, um, and then we have 10 minutes for, for more questions. Um, the way I see scientific software packages today is that they're fundamentally different from sort of the small academic code that we all write for our own purposes. And um, that the issue is principally about the complexity, the technical and human complexity of these projects because they're so huge, uh, both in terms of the, the code base and the number of people involved. And um, so a lot of my thoughts around these sort of things is not just about the complexity itself, but how humans deal with this complexity. How can we um, figure out technical and human ways to break things down into chunks that we can understand and deal with? And um, that at the end of the day, 
um, being a successful software manager in the scientific software realm really requires that you um, understand that it's about humans and that humans come with different skills and different motivations and that you have to take them where they are. So um, there are two other pieces of information that I would like to link to. One is a blog post that I wrote a while ago for the Better Scientific Software blog. Um, the link is there and you all have access to the PDF files. And then um, my former um, postdoc and now good friend and colleague Timo Heister and I wrote a, um, um, an article for computational science and discovery about this as well. And I think with that, that would be a good place to come back to questions. Thank you, Wolfgang. Very nice. We do have some questions here. Uh, let me see here. As a physicist and mathematician, do you produce more in science or computer coding? How can you reach a balance between being productive, productive in science and coding with the best practice? Well, um, so I'm really fortunate in my career. Um, that um, I have a permanent position in one department, but in reality, I sit between a whole bunch of departments, right? I, um, the math department pays my salary because I think I also produce good mathematics, but I work with people in the geosciences and I have a courtesy appointment in the geosciences department. And I work with people in physics and in chemistry and a whole bunch of other places. And um, so um, I don't think of myself as somebody who's tied down to one specific um, discipline. I. I am somebody who I, I think of myself as a technology transfer agent, right? I, I talk to um, my math colleagues developing new um, finite element schemes and then coming up with ways to implement them in such a way that people from many different disciplines can use them. And, um, and for me, that's a beautiful place to be. Um, and it involves um, learning from people in many different disciplines and it involves um, some human resource management, uh, human resource management, and it involves some programming and it involves a little bit of mathematics and a little bit of chemistry and physics. And, um, and so um, my world is very broad. I'm not somebody who goes really deep into stuff, um, but that's just because that's what I'm good at. It's, and, and it's all a balance, yes. Okay, another one here to paraphrase, Seymour Cray, <laughs> would you rather write software, software with two professional programmers or 100 volunteers and grad students? Well, um, I mean, this is, this is a funny question, right? Um, I, I think, um, personally, I enjoy the interaction with people. I, I am it, it makes me happy to have, you know, 100 volunteers and, and work with them and teach them. And, you know, as a professor, I'm a teacher, right? And, um, and I enjoy that part too. Um, in practice, if you need to get something done, you know, next week, um, then the two professional programmers are probably the better choice, right? Um, but that is that is not my choice. I don't have the money to pay two professional programmers. The National Science Foundation does not give money um, at a level that would allow any of the projects that are out there um, to do this. Um, that's just not that's not part of our world. I think if um, if you wanted to be part of that world, the national labs, for example, would be an excellent place. Um, if you think about the Exascale Computing Project, they do have money for these sort of things. But that is just not part of academia. All right. So let me. Uh, okay. So do you see the current level of package complexity as a necessary feature to achieve modern functionality, or as an undesirable side effect that we are realizing post facto, and we could aspire to simpler structure in the future? Now there's absolutely nothing you can do about it, right? I mean, at the time, so I, I keep coming back to BLAS because BLAS is to me, one of the very first, you know, successful long-term projects that have survived out of the era of the seventies and eighties to today, um, defining an interface that has been essentially unchanged since the 1980s. Um, and I um, 
I mean, there are other people who are probably more qualified to answer this, but I would expect that the original blast had maybe, you know, somewhere between two and 5,000 lines of code. It was not terribly difficult. Um, but if you think about um, how this looks like today, I'm pretty sure that today's implementations of the blast have tens of thousands, maybe over 100,000 lines of code, simply because that's how complicated our processors have become. And, um, and I really don't see um, how we could do any different, right? That the software has become complicated because the methods are complicated. Um, I mean, we can solve PDEs today, um, you know, that are coupled and we can do this in parallel with high order methods on complicated meshes with hanging nodes um, and an algebraic multigrid preconditioner. And so, I mean, these are all things that weren't around in the 1980s. And um, that's what drives the complexity is because the methods that we have are just so much more, so much better and so much more complicated. And the software simply reflects that. It's not like um, we made a mistake. Um, this is just what it is. And Wolfgang, how do you avoid micromanaging uh, new students and the code they write? Yeah, I don't know. You probably need to ask my students about this. Um, um, it's difficult, right? And and I think I mean that that is not uh, specific to um, to this particular area. But um, if you have thirty years of experience doing something, um, a lot of things you can do faster and better than a student who does not have that experience. And um, it requires letting go. Um, and I think um, I didn't mention this, but um, I think a lot of the successful um, software packages are written by people. Let's say a lot of the successful packages with, with big developer communities are written by people who have the ability to let go um, to say, yeah, yeah, I started this and, um, and I'm very attached to it, but I'm happy to let somebody else take this piece. Um, and that's really difficult, right? Um, I mean, you're, in, you're emotionally invested in your software and it's difficult to let somebody else deal with it. Um, and I think um, some people are better than that um, than others. And the people who do not have the ability to let go um, are fundamentally the ones who, at the end, continue to work on projects that only they and maybe two or three others are working on, um, as opposed to these big developer coll collaborations that we have in deal two in Aspect, for example. So, um, if you're starting deal two from scratch, would be would it be reasonable? Would be reasonable. What would you do differently? with your current knowledge? Yeah, that's probably a good question. I mean, um, you know, people ask, for example, would I use a different programming language? And I think probably not, um, because the entire um, ecosystem in high performance computing is written in C and C++ today. Um, so there's really no good reason to choose anything different. Um, there are some technical decisions that I think we would do, do differently. Um, but um, one of the things that I, that I continue to be surprised by is that we, by and large, chose fairly good um, software design. Um, that um, there are not many pe many places where I would say, oh, this was the wrong abstraction, where these two classes should not have been coupled. And um, so I maybe I'm biased because I wrote a lot of the fundamental fundamental pieces of the library, but I don't really have the impression that we should do something vastly, completely different. Um, I would probably today not build our own linear algebra, um, but I would simply build on something like Petsy or Trillimus, except that didn't exist in 1997 um, or wasn't as, access, as accessible in 1997. And so we have our own implementation of linear algebra, at least for a single processor jobs that I wouldn't do anymore. Yes, for the participants here, we'll ask uh, Wolfgang to go through the Q&A later and check mm -hmm. the answers. But let's take, let, for, I think we have time here for another question. Uh, on the focus of academia to publish papers over publishing code, uh, how do you handle this personally and with your grad students? Also, how do you handle the training requirements internally? Do you use existing resources like MOOC or do you do one on training or something else? Okay, so let's let's go to the papers first. Um, so if you want to have a successful career in academia, 
um, then publications is um, is the quantity that matters, right? And um, so I, um, I I am fortunate because I don't just build deal two, but I use it um, for collaborations with people in other disciplines and. Um, a sufficient number of publications has come come out of this to allow me to have a good academic career. Um, the um, there is um, an alternative path. Um, so, if you can demonstrate that whatever package you have is, you know, really widely used, um, then um, that is something that the NSF, for example, cares about and funds. And um, I suspect that in academia you can get by with some fewer publications if you if you are able to bring in big grants. So Deal Two, for example, is currently funded by a grant to Timo Heister and myself um, that uh, pays us 1.8 million, well, not us, but that that pay, that gives our universities 1.8 million dollars. That's quite a sizable grant from the NSF, and our departments appreciate that. Um, so. Um, that is certainly helpful in, in having a, um, a decent career. Um, we do make sure, um, several years ago, we, we made the decision that we should write a paper about every release. And um, the uh, rationale for that was not that we think that what we do in one release from, from one release to the next is scientifically super interesting, but it is that it gives us a way to um, make everybody who contributed to one release um, the opportunity to be co-author um, on this paper. Um, so everybody who contributes in some substantial way um, to the development of the library um, can be a co-author on one of those papers. And these are generally quite well-cited papers. I mean, they get hundreds of citations in the next two or three or four years. And, um, and that is something that matters um, to a lot of um, to a lot of people because it that helps them explain their careers to potential employers. Um, as far as training is concerned, um, so um, Deal Two has a reputation, I think, rightfully so, as a very well documented uh, piece of software, um, and we spent a large, large amount of time writing very good documentation, writing tutorials, um, writing creating video lectures that explain deal two to other people. Um, that's part of what you need to do if you want uh, people to learn the software without having to ask you a lot of questions. Because the one thing that does not scale is if you have a thousand users and they all have questions and ask them on a mailing list. Um, no volunteer organization can muster the effort to answer all of these questions. What you need to do is to um, have all of these answers written in places where people can find them themselves. That's that's fundamentally what it comes down to. Just bear with me here. Since you mentioned the National Science Foundation, there is a question here. Uh, should the Department of Energy change change funding to better support your ideas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Of course, they should give me money. Uh, what a question. Um, Arthur, do you have an in somewhere? <laughs> um, so, um, I mean, I, I I have you know thought about this for a long time, and I, I have reviewed for the National Science Foundation on many occasions, for example. So the National Science Foundation has understood over the last um, ten or so years, or maybe fifteen, that uh, software packages like DL2 are fundamental infrastructure in the same way as um, you know telescopes and um, particle accelerators are, um, that they support a lot of secondary science, right? That um, we have the opportunity to provide you with a software tool that does 90% of what you need to simulate the growth of plant roots or um, the oscillations in the magnetosphere of the earth, right? These are the things. And um, so um, from the perspective of the National Science Foundation, uh, there is the there is the choice of either letting everybody write their own software um, and be not quite as productive, or to support projects like ours, write documentation, write tutorials, and so on and so forth, so that people have an easier time um, to do the science they want to do. In much the same way as you could say, well, all of the astronomers you know, get a little bit of money to build their own telescopes. Well, you're probably not going to get quite as good science out of it. And, um, and I think, 
um, the National Science Foundation has understood this and DOE has understood this much to a much bigger degree um, as well. Um, so I, I'm not terribly concerned right now that um, that understanding doesn't exist. Um, the problem with the National Science Foundation, I think, is that um, we have to go through peer review with our proposals every five years because there is no you know, key list of packages that NSF would consider a critical infrastructure that, um, that you know, gets sort of a, a base funding. And I think that makes it quite difficult for a lot of us to really have long-term planning stability, for example, long-term, um, just, yeah, just, just a foundational level where we can say, yeah, I, can, I, I know I can engage in this for the next 10 years. Um, that part doesn't exist, but that's just how it is. Um, I, I think, I mean, if the question is, should DOE um, support deal two, um, that is a decision that DOE needs to make. Okay, so let me share my screen here just to close. Thank you, um, Wolfgang and the participants. Thank you all. Uh, so uh, again, so we'd like to improve this series. Uh, please give us feedback. I have already pasted this uh, link in the chat. The slides are already available. The recording will be available later today. And with that, I'd like to announce the next webinar in the series. It's going to be about a month from today. Migrating to the to heterogeneous computing, the lessons learned in the Sierra and El Capitan centers of excellence. And uh, this webinar will be presented by Dave Richards from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And we are already accepting, you know, it's already open for people to register. Uh, thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Wolfman. My pleasure. As a community, I care about it. It's fun to talk to all of you. <laughs>